Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started, everybody. Nice to see all these smiling faces. Welcome. Um, I'm Kara Brennan Alamano. I am the Chief People Officer here at Lattice, and um, I'm joined by Wesley Pua and Gianna. Whoa, I'm sorry, your last name, Gianna? Driver. Driver, I'm sorry. Gianna and Wes and I um, are here to talk about how to work together across the C-suite. Um, Wes is a CFO, Gianna is a Chief People Officer, I sit in a Chief People Officer seat. And, um, and I think, first of all, that there are a lot of misconceptions about how CFOs and CPOs work together. So with Gianna's help and Wes's help, I'd like to talk through some of that because I think it's really important. Um, it, is, it is the key relationship to our success uh, in, in each of our roles, I believe. And uh, I want to start having um, more open conversations about that dynamic because I think it's really helpful to us as, a, as an HR um, profession for us to think about that and think about the ways that we can really partner with our finance leaders. Um, and I just, I think both of these people are just really cool people. <laughs> and I would love for you to introduce yourself. Gianna's at Exabeam. And um, if you could start and then we'll have Wes talk about um, your experience. Sure, yeah, so thanks, Kara. Um, is this, oh, wow, that sounded really loud. Okay, is, th is this okay? You're good, okay. you're good. Um, so Gianna Driver, um, I uh, work um, for a company called Exabeam, cybersecurity company, and I've been in the, the people space for almost 20 years, um, primarily here in, in Silicon Valley, um, and it's been super interesting to see the evolution of the people space over the last you know, 15, 20 years. Really, really interesting. So super excited to be here and to talk about some of the HR finance dynamics. Hey everyone, my name is Wesley. I've known Kara for a while now. A long time. Long time. I, I Two decades almost? Probably, yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So I'm um, the CFO of Fabric. Um, we are basically the people that help commerce and retailers expand their GMV. So like the, the goal of Fabric is to expand the GMV of the internet over time. Um, yeah, been in finance for a long time, too long, reform banker, reform hedge fund person, been in the startup space for a while now. And yeah, like I think the thing that I always remind people of, and the thing they forget, is that companies are made up of people. And once you kind of have that kind of as a guiding philosophy, a lot of the other things just kind of fall in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sharing, Wes and I were finance and then people partners in two companies, so that was Planet and Udemy most recently. And Gianna and I just met, but we have a lot in common in terms of how we think about these things. Totally. So really excited to explore this conversation um, today and hopefully start spark a broader conversation around this relationship and how it can be best leveraged um, for for what we need as a business especially in this in the day and age we're in right now um, so I'd love to hear from each of you what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about this relationship among c-suite leaders and specifically the folks on the people side and the finance side um, because I just want to hit the nail, I just want to go straight to that, to that misconception. So Gianna, do you want to get started? Sure, yeah. I think there's this notion that um, HR and, and finance are constantly battling and that there's this like knife fight going on behind closed doors. <laughs> um, and as, as scintillating and, and as exciting as that sounds, um, it actually isn't what happens. Um, and that can't happen in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a really close partnership and collaboration. Um, it's almost like right hand, left hand, left hand, right hand, where it's working together um, with, with different perspectives that makes a company successful ultimately. So I think the misconception is that we're on opposite sides of the table when actually it's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Wes? So each C-suite leader has kind of a different lens of a business, rightfully so. And when you bring them all together, like everyone can argue, debate, and kind of figure out what's the right thing to do for the company, but with each of those perspectives, then you can get a holistic view of the business. People in finance are arguably the two organizations that actually look at an entire company. You know, like marketing, focusing on marketing, sales on revenue, uh, engineering product on very kind of, not narrow, but specific views of an organization, and we have to manage everything yes. and kind of look across. So um, yes, different lenses, 
yes, potentially different points of view. You know, the the standard CFO, like the the no FO, if you will, or the person who's like, you can't do it for various budget reasons. <laughs> the the soft and squishy older view of like what HR used to be versus a strategic partner. Like, there are these archaic concepts of what the roles were, but especially over the last three years, like how those roles have evolved and how we've had to all work together in new and different ways have kind of changed all of our roles for the future. Yeah, and I think what I learned when I wanted to move to the C-suite was that road is paved with the partnerships you have with particularly your finance partner. And I have never seen a CHRO that I would define as, as truly successful in the role that hasn't had that deep, strong, trusted relationship and, and had a relationship where there is open challenge and um, open discussion because, as you said, we, we are where the rubber hits the road for the business. So one of the very first things I look for when I look for a new role or when I'm in my role and we're, we're hiring in, I've had the privilege of hiring in CFOs as well, is really um, finding somebody that can be a real partner on the people side of the business. And partnership to me at that level doesn't mean somebody who's a yes person. It also doesn't mean somebody who's a no FO either. Um, but it does mean somebody who can be that other, that other, um, conver that other person in the conversation. And you know, to give a few examples, a lot of, of my relationship with Wes over the past eight years, and Gianna, I'd love to hear your relationship with your CFOs, is, Wes, am I thinking about this the right way? And a lot of times you would come to me with, hey, Kara, this might be a blind spot, but you might not be seeing this in the business. You need to know that this is something that's top of mind for the board of directors, for the sales team. This is something that's going to be coming to you. So it's really a benefit to the business if we have alignment and we've talked through it. And he can educate me on what you're seeing on the finance side. And I can come to the table with like, OK, A, B, and C strategy solutions from the people side. And, um, and I get really excited when I see um, really great CPOs who are able to articulate that kind of that kind of relationship and that kind of dynamic as well too. So, Jan, I'd love to hear about your experience with your C CFO partners. Yeah. So, thankfully, um, I've been fortunate to have pretty tight and close relationships with with my CFOs, and um, part of that is also I've been pretty discerning about companies that yeah. I would join, yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Because I know that that's integral to to success. Um, that said, I think a high functioning relationship is not without conflict. Mm -hmm. So, I want to be clear that when I say a healthy you know, collaborative partnership. It is a partnership of um, d of respect, but also of, of disagreement. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, often um, my CFO today, like she and I, will have different perspectives about things, and that's okay. Um, and we we have those hard conversations. And I do think it's because we're able to have hard conversations that we're able to come out on the other side with, frankly, usually a solution that's better than what she and I were thinking, independent of each other. Mm -hmm. 100%. So it helps make you better in totally. job, right? And not totally. to be Susie Sunshine, but like we also want to be real about how this plays out in the day to day and, and what we have leveraged in our roles that have made us better. Yeah. Um, I love this question because it's, it's a good question about um, what do your first 90 days look like or when you're new to a company, Wes, because you're in this spot, so you get the first answer. I am. Um, you're new. How do you build that trust, right? You're coming into a role. You know you're working across the C-suite. I think we'd, I'd like to start with the CFO conversation, and then we can broaden it to the trust among a senior team level. You see the real power of somebody who's been able to build trust and credibility early in that cycle. Mm -hmm. And then you see their ability to really achieve what they want to achieve as a leader. And then all of us has been in that companies where you're like, that company where it's like, oh, no, mom and dad are fighting. <laughs> And I'm not going to get anything done at my level because there's not credibility and yeah. trust at the at the level where the the business actually gets executed. Um, would love to hear from you, Wes, sitting in that seat right now, um, how you're thinking about that. Sure. Um, so I joined Fabric six <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> um, during those six weeks, I came in two weeks before my start date because they were thinking about you know a reduction, layoffs, all these things. 
and you can just smell like morale was low. Like <laughs> people were reacting to some notion that just didn't make sense. And so it goes back to like everything we've been talking about. Like, hey, is that the right thing for the business to do? Let's figure out what the right path forward is and just do that. So in my first six weeks, I had to fight off a layoff, had to argue with the board, SVB, <laughs> um, and other things. So it's been a lot. Um, what my normal 90 days would be uh, would be what I'm kind of doing in parallel, which is the world tour. Like, ask a ton of questions, meet a bunch of people, find one, the people with the titles, but also the people who are cultural leaders who don't have the titles. Mm -hmm. Like, who really makes the decisions? Who, who influences people? Um, and just hear what they have to say. You know, in, in my world tour so far, it's been the same message. And like, it's fascinating because the depth of consistency I've never seen anywhere else. And it's like, okay, here's a clear problem that we have to address. Mm -hmm. And since we are primarily a virtual company, like we don't have an office, um, there are issues around alignment. There are issues around communication. There are issues around prioritization and focus and all these kind of normal things. And the upside is we have really great people, really great talent, mm -hmm. and they just don't know, hey, do I do A or B or C? And in what order? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, we need to do that. And so I joined, um, again, six weeks ago for a virtual company. I was like, hey, when's the last time we talked to the company? I'm like, oh, October. I was like, October, <laughs> okay? And they recorded it, and I watched it. I was like, okay, this, this is a little painful. Um, I was like, when are we talking to the company next? Oh, you know, maybe March. I was like, let's figure out another cadence. Let's make sure we talk to people. Like, the usual kind of corporate calendar stuff that, like, do people know what's going on? Do they have a clear path to success? Do we know all our little dopamine triggers that make us feel good in the day? Like, all the little things that I think we take for granted in a kind of in-office environment that just needed a little bit of love. So. And some of that sounds like traditionally HRCPO world, but as a CFO, and I, and I know you're not alone, these are things that CFOs, good CFOs, are very aware that need to happen and, and can be, again, the person that's coming in like, let's work on best practices here. I know that the, these are things that drive the business forward. Gianna. Yeah, you know, I, I think in the first 30, 60, 90 days, I, I agree very much with, with what Wes was saying around it is building the relationships. But I also, I like to take extra time to really get to know the person, not just their org chart and their priorities and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, but who, who are you as, as a human being and connect on that human level. And what I found is when disagreements and conflict arise, if we know each other as human beings, that allows us to overcome that conflict in a lot more healthy and, and thoughtful ways. Um, I would also say that um, just thinking back to, to my current workplace, um, you know, there, there have been times where um, shortly after that kind of the honeymoon phase of, of starting a new role when you realize holy smokes what did I get myself into um, there were there were moments of disagreement with not only the CFO but some other people on the on the leadership team and as hard as it was I did in my newness approach them one-on-one -on -one and say can we stop and press rewind and replay that experience because that didn't feel very good for me. Um, my experience was X, Y, and Z, um, and I'm sure that there's more to this and I really want to understand. So can you walk me through what you were thinking and your perspective? And what I found is um, that sort of leaning into those, those hard conversations allowed us to come out on the other side a lot closer. And I didn't hesitate to have those conversations early on, um, even though it's super hard. When, you, when you're the new person and everyone knows everyone, to sort of say, wait, hold on a second. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not calling you out in an accusatory way, but kind of in a one-on-one -on -one setting saying, I, you know, like next time, by the way, I'd really appreciate it if you'd come to me directly as opposed to our CEO, as an example, right, of something or, or whatever the case may be. Um, but then understanding also the opposite perspective around, well, what were they thinking when they, you know, chose to go down that path and, and make those decisions? And that's been really helpful for paving the way for, I think, better relationships after that. Um, plus one to that. And I think what I'm hearing you say in, in some ways is like it is a relationship like all other relationships and, and there isn't yeah. necessarily 
something particularly, we don't get a free pass at the, the sea level, right? It's still navigating relationships with respect and, and communication. Um, while you're also dealing with really high stakes, especially in this environment. Um, so I think what's interesting to me is, is hearing how you navigate that, Gianna, as you were showing, um, you're displaying the behaviors that you will then call on the rest of the org to display Drinking as a people leader. Drinking our own champagne. Right, drinking <laughs> your own champagne. I hear that. So I, so I hear that from you and, and appreciate that. Um, this is a great question in terms of um, getting down to some of the brass tacks of, of our role as CPOs. Was there any workplace philosophy you thought you'd never budge on um, only for your counterpart, your CFO, to convince you otherwise? And, um, and I had a dynamic with um, a previous CFO, and I'd be interested to hear from you, Wes, on this. <laughs> Um, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> we both worked for the same person. Um, where I felt really strongly, and I won't go into all the detail of it, but it was about bonus plans and, and details around bonus plans and how I thought it should have been done, and he had a very different perspective on that. And then went through the process and had some conversations and realized that at the end of the day, we both agreed in terms of we wanted to have really good incentives for people to get to the right place from a compensation perspective, but we were looking at it from, from different, different sides, which I, I think is probably one of those places where you can get really crunchy with a CFO, right? Because when you're talking about compensation, that's a world where there's crossover there, there is equal um, investment from both sides in terms of a compensation philosophy and getting alignment, but it's also something that's really important to the business. This is the biggest spin that the business has is, for the most part, depending on your business, but, but functionally, usually your, your salary is your biggest spend. Um, so really getting to a place where you feel good about what that outcome is, is really important. And I found it, it took a pause for me to step back and say, wow, what I'm hearing him say is really about simplifying and streamlining where we go with this and sitting back and saying, I think I can communicate around this in a way that, that lands in a positive place for everybody, and it did, and it was the right decision. Um, but it was a moment in time when I had to say, like, there's something to be learned here, and then also open myself up to like the different options in, this, in the process. Gianna, have you had that experience? And I would love to hear, Wes, your experience in potentially convincing somebody on the other side of, of something different than they've seen. Yeah. And I would love to hear just in general, in your conversations with the people leaders that you've dealt with, <laughs> myself included, um, <laughs> some advice in terms of how we can communicate better with you on, that, on these types of things. Gianna. Yeah, so so the example that comes to mind, um, oh, I have multiple examples, but the one that's sort of front and center of my mind is um, a time not too long ago where my CFO and I had different perspectives around how to handle a legal matter um, regarding a, a former employee um, who was coming forth with um, with various types of claims. Um, and, and my perspective was um, that yes, we're in the moral right and we could probably win this, but let's just settle and move on and not spend time and energy on this and, um, you know, just kind of move on with our, with our business and focus on other things. Um, you know, her perspective was a little bit different, which was, well, I want to make an example of this and, and, you know, not have other people think that they can get away with these types of, you know, claims and, and, and et cetera. So two very valid but different perspectives. Um, Ultimately, we landed at um, a bit of a middle ground where it's like, okay, well, we are willing to come to a compromise and to settle up to this amount, but they're not going to take us to the cleaners for this other egregious amount. Um, and I think that it was because we were able to have really meaningful dialogue that we were able to come up with a solution that was truly a bit of the like a middle path, right? It was neither you know my perspective nor her perspective that that we started out with where we landed, but we landed in the middle, um, and because 
because this was a little bit of a, a sensitive topic, we went to our CEO and said, look, we initially kind of, you know, had differing perspectives. We landed here, but before we execute on this, what do you think? Because, you know, we can frankly do any of like option A, B, or C, now that we've come up with this option C. <laughs> Thankfully, he was aligned to option C, so that's what we went with. Um, but that's where my opinion, you know, changed because I, I realized, wow, like I, you know, I, I do see that valid perspective of making an example, you know, to, to others to deter you know, potential bad behaviors. Wes? I, two questions here, which was a, a situation where you have been in a situation where things have, you've changed minds, hearts and minds, and then what is helpful from the HR perspective, the people team perspective, because those are the folks that are sitting here in terms of communicating with you and, and helping be a, a key partner there. Yeah, um, people are hard, <laughs> like full stop. <laughs> And I have a lot of empathy for those of you in the profession, because like, wild cards on a daily basis. Like someone could just wake up wrong and you just have a hard day. And like, <laughs> I, I think especially when you talk about compensation, like probably the most difficult conversation to have because the only right answer is more. <laughs> so like, I empathize, because I'm not that person to be like, yeah, more is okay, let's do that. Um, so, I'm weird in finance, let me say that. And like, I also empathize with people that work with the more traditional style of CFO because like, they're, they're hard people. Um, they're unique people. And like, that role is very focused on how do we drive value? How do we make sure we hit our numbers? How do we make sure that our investors are happy? Full stop. By hook or by crook, we're gonna get there. Hopefully less crook, hopefully more hook. Um, but the way I look at it is like, how do we actually drive the business forward? How do we actually hit key milestones in terms of shareholder value, in terms of like our own equity, in terms of making sure that our employees are getting something out of this job too, regardless of whatever logo they end up at next? So I, I go by one kind of very simple driving principle and a very simple person, and that's like, is it right? Because we all know the answer. Like, yes, there's nuance. Like, 85% of the time, we can get to it right, and then the rest of the 15, we have to argue a bit. And argumentation is never bad. But if we just ask, is this right for the business? Is it right for the person? Is it right for the leadership team? Like, yeah, you can get most of the way there pretty easily. Um, and usually that helps. You know, like, I think when we get into the, the argument, there's a lot of kind of confirmation bias. There's a lot of anchoring bias. There's a lot of, like, well, I did all this work that got me here. Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. Did we do the right work? And like, what was the outcome that we wanted or what's the right outcome for the situation? And we can kind of work back to get there. Um, so usually it's that, like, not to get into specifics, but like, if we run down a path around like, yes, we have to give this person this, or yes, this settlement results in this, or yes, the right business prioritization is this, and something just doesn't smell right, like intuitively, like, hey, so tell me more about that. Like, what happened there? Um, I love this concept from a large company that I'm not going to specifically advertise. But it's the concept of precision questioning, where you just ask the next question, and the next, and the next, and the next, until you really get to those first principles. And nine times out of 10, you never actually get to the first principle, because it breaks down pretty quickly. Mm. It's like, OK, so if we don't know that answer, how do we actually build to find the solution for that answer? Um, so yeah, like I, I think generally things are simple. I think generally people are hard. And then bringing those two together, like thank God for all of you, like you guys make this so much easier. <laughs> what have HR folks done to help you get through those precision questions faster, get to a place of comfort on your end? Yeah, for kind of the more, as an introvert, as a finance guy, like the numbers are always safe. Mm -hmm. So. Show me the value, show me the ROI, like what is this action, item, event, program, what is this doing for us either financially uh, in terms of moving the product forward, in terms of moving an initiative or strategy forward, and how does it scale? Like, I don't think any executive loves a one-off. <laughs> so like, how do we actually make this something that we can use universally, and how is it actually, like, I love the concept of rising tides raise all ships. So mm -hmm. as we think through these initiatives, how does it make us all better? And yeah, usually you can follow on us pretty quickly. But ROI, <laughs> always a good one. Like, 
there are moments where like, okay, so what am I getting for this? But not me, shareholders. But it's, it's a, always a good question to ask. Like, so what does this do for the company? And if we don't know that answer, then it's probably going to fall flat pretty quickly. Hmm. Um, this one reflects a little bit of what we were talking about before. Emotions are really high in tech right now. I think that's probably pretty, I see some nodding heads around here. Yeah. Um, and it, it makes some of these people decisions that are also business decisions really, really challenging. Um, what is a piece of advice you might have for folks sitting here, folks who will be listening, um, how to think about this and how to think about this in the context of your partnership with the C-suite and how you navigate this tough time? And it's fair if you say, I don't have a great piece of advice, but, but having been dealing with this for the last six to nine months, um, what, what would you, if someone came and asked you, like, how have you made it through? How have you been making really good decisions during this time? would love to hear some of your insights, Gianna. Yeah, so I'll say, just to acknowledge, it, it's a really hard time, yeah. right? Especially if you're in tech right now, I mean, it's just a, it's a really crappy, hard time. Um, so just acknowledging that, um, you know, I, I don't think there's a silver bullet solution, um, but some things that I have found to be helpful in some of the conversations and, and navigating some really emotional, dicey waters, um, including with, with my CFO at times, is um, yes, there's the lens of the bottom line and ROI and that type of thing. Um, but if we look at the people and the human perspective, um, being human, rising to our values and really embodying that speaks volumes, not just today, but also for the future. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times, no offense, Wes, but CFOs can be focused on if you're doing a layoff or, you know, whatever, oh, the package that these folks are getting and, you know, all of that kind of thing. And those are valid perspectives. But I would also say it's equally important to remember that you're setting an example for all of your existing employees as well. And so being human centered um, and, and approaching this from different perspectives, not just the bottom line, is really important. The other thing I would say is leaning into your authentic self and, and communicating. I think a lot of times it's easy to communicate when communication is good news, mm -hmm. but when communication is hard and it's crappy news, I think still all the more we need to communicate that news even when it's hard. And I think you'd be surprised at people's capacity to mm -hmm. receive information, including hard information, if you're just honest and authentic with them and if you approach it with humility and kindness. Um, right, and so it's you know if, if you're if you're doing a round of layoffs or, or furloughs or you know whatever, leaning into the hard conversations and saying here was our thought process, here's where we landed, here's why. Um, that way, people know that you're approaching this from the best of the best places of, in, of intent. Wes, you were talking a little bit about some of the bumpy ride you've had sure. into into this new role. Um, and it sounds like you definitely had, um, you participated in some people-related decisions that, uh, along those lines. What were, what was some of your, your, what were some of your guiding principles or advice that, that you followed during those times? I think to one of Jana's points, it did kill a layoff because the second order saved me a bunch of severance. <laughs> so that was the second order, but it helped. Um, the first order was actually more morale and people and community and culture and like, Talent. Um, I, I have these weird kind of one-liners in my head, and like one of them that I also live by is people are persons too. And part of that always, to me, points to talent strategy. Like, you can't do anything at a company if you don't have the right people doing the jobs. And I think that's the hard thing now, and as a virtual company, even harder, because we don't actually get to know our people, we don't really know how to incentivize them, motivate them, like really get them truly productive. You know, like I, if, if we all think back to the last three years, um, Slack, Zoom, Google Meet, like however you're meeting virtually, like it all felt very transactional. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we're fighting actively. How do we make the experience less transactional? Because no one wants to be a number, no one wants just to be a simple kind of, a simple, a transaction between two people. So how do we actually broaden 
the value of the conversation, of the prioritization, of whatever the initiative is. Um, so I think the two things that we've been tackling kind of in this world is, one, just how do we think about the right talent strategy or the right philosophy around talent strategy? And two, how do we motivate people appropriately? Mm -hmm. When you can't just like tap someone on the shoulder or can't give them like a silly trophy or like can't do these little things that build cultural value, the old water cooler moments. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you do it in a way that's genuine, authentic, truly valued on both sides? Like, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. I agree. I'm just going to put in yeah. a plug for, for Lattice. This is not sponsored by Lattice, but I, I, will, <laughs> I, will, I will truly say that in this remote world, um, for the Lattice users out there, the, the feedback function, the kudos function, has been one of our best friends because that's an opportunity in a remote environment to kind of virtually tap someone on the shoulder and say, by the way, thank you for doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and it becomes part of their performance review and you know all of that kind of stuff. So use technology technology in this you know, virtual world because there are tools like Lattice, genuinely and truly, and Kara did not ask me to say this, um, <laughs> that, that really make um, you know, us feel more connected to one another. Thank you. Um, a last question before we go to some questions that were submitted was, how, do you, how have you seen the role of the CEO um, in in the dynamics that you've had with your with your people partners and your finance partners, what role have they played? How has the relationships that you've had enhanced your ability to to work with the CEO or deliver for a CEO? Would love to talk a little bit, um, pull the curtain back a little bit on on that dynamic as well. So, Gianna. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking through specific examples. Um, so thankfully, my, my CEO is very collaborative. And a lot of times, what he'll do is he'll say, Gianna and Holly, my, my CFO, go figure out a solution and come, come back to me and, and let me know what you think, which is wonderful because it almost is a beautiful forcing function mm -hmm. for she and I to have conversations and to really talk things through. And typically, what happens is we'll then converse amongst ourselves, then go back to him with whatever it is that, that we want to do and what we jointly propose, um, and 9.9 .9 times out of 10, he's aligned to that and that's what we end up doing. That said, there are certainly times where she and I have different perspectives. We have different you know, opinions about things. Um, and so we come to him with that. I have found for me, um, I, don't, I don't keep score in terms of like a win-loss because then like you're, you're, by default, you're not on the same team then, right? If it's like, oh, ha ha, like I won this win or you know, like he won that one or what, like I don't, I don't do that. Um, but I, I, do, um, I do lean on data during these times whenever you know, there is a, just a different perspective. Um, and I think a lot of times our brains think in specifics. So to be very specific, um, and I see one of my team members here who's in the audience, so he'll know who I'm, who I'm talking about here. Um, we had a conversation last year around the importance of learning. So this is a time where many of us are tightening the belt and looking at ways to do things, like do more with less and you know all of that. And there was a conversation around, well, is the learning function really necessary and needed, right? Is that just kind of a nice to have fringe sort of thing that we have when times are good? Um, and you know, the, the net of this is that I believe very strongly in the value of a robust, well-resourced learning function. Um, and you know, during leaner times, I think there was a, you know, she had a different perspective. Again, both perspectives are, are very valid. Um, and so we were a little bit at an impasse because I was on my mountain of yes, this is integral, and she was on her mountain of no, this is not mission critical. That's where having some data to back up um, you know, just different perspectives was really helpful. I go a lot to Gartner and to Sherm for information, and so it was really helpful when I could pull data objectively, not Gianna's data, but truly data from external outside sources that say, when you're at about 550 people big, you have your first learning resource statistically. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at similar size, you know, companies, tech companies, that type of thing. Um, then we looked at our attrition data, and we said the number one reason for regrettable attrition at our company is lack of career development and, and career growth. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, our solution to that, guess what, is, is learning. So let's look at how much attrition is costing us, and let's look at what the headcount cost would be of a learning resource. And so this is where, again, she and I still had different opinions, but when we met with our CEO, I, I came with my cadre of data to say, you know, like here, here's, you know, information. Um, and ultimately, I wasn't attached to the outcome, right? Like this is what I believe. But you know, if the decision is that we need to go in a direction that means that we don't have learning, you know, as as a headcount this year, like that's okay. Thankfully, we did land at a place of okay, this. This is objectively something that could save us money, and it was speaking finance speak, like it could, you know, like help on the ROI side of things because we're going to be able to retain the talent that we want to retain. So I'm happy to say that we do have a learning person who's awesome. So <laughs> I love that example. Thank you for being specific, and it is always yeah. really great. great to hear how someone else has approached it yeah. on the people side. Yeah. Um, Wes, how how has your how have your CEOs played in in the dynamics that on the people side and, and CFO side. You've known a few of them. I have, um, yes. Plus one on benchmarking, like having yes. data, having yes. kind of a solid point of view that isn't yours. You know, like this is what we can point to and here's where it goes on top of. Um, I can think of two types of CEOs uh, that I've worked with. One highly collaborative, one highly adversarial. Mm -hmm. So collaborative, exactly. You know, like let's come to a point of view, or if there's a question, there's an initiative, there's a program, hey, you go figure it out, come with a recommendation, and then let's talk it through. And in the best case scenario, here's the recommendation, yes, it works. Less good scenario, here's the recommendation, some interesting questioning, and then we find a solution that works for the company. Great. Um, the adversarial CEO uh, is a funny one where uh, often they come in like, this is wrong, go fix it. Or, hey, this is bro broken, we have to get rid of it. Or, hey, this team isn't working, just cut them. And it's like, cool, uh, help me understand what's going on. And five times out of 10, they were right. And so we had to figure out what the situation was. The other five times, they were wrong. <laughs> and we had to clarify, okay, so this is what we're seeing, this is what's happening, and this is what we think is the solution that you're looking for, and it's already happening and they just didn't know. So sometimes it's as simple as communication or these other things, and sometimes people just come in hot, and you have to hear them out and then drive to actually, so what's the real data here? What's actually happening versus just kind of feelings, emotions, whatever, and okay, like, well, this is the reality. What's the problem in the reality? Mm -hmm. And usually it's not a problem in the reality. It's just someone didn't know something. I think that goes back to what you were saying in terms of the GNA function as a whole, having a perspective that a lot of other parts of the business just don't, and recognizing that some of this is about information and education um, and, and insight as much as it is you know, managing some broader uncertainty or broader risk with the business. So reinforcing on that front. Um, okay, going to a couple of submitted questions. What are some tips for um, framing up or, or working through budgets? Um, <laughs> I know, this, this is tactical. To sponsor initiatives that may not have that ROI clearly attached. I mean, I love, Gianna, how you took that approach. Um, but these are things about ERGs, cultural celebrations, company milestones. I could probably make the case that some of those are, are clearly ROI connected, but we all know. We have those things on the people side where no matter what I do, I'm not gonna come up with a convincing data point. Um, how have you approached that, Gianna, with the folks on, on, on the other side, and, and Wes, what has been, yeah. what has resonated with you on that front? Mm -hmm. So this is where, um, if, if we don't have data that, that exists currently, going out and trying to, to create a trend line or baseline or something so that you've got something more than nothing is really helpful. I've had to get very creative about how we do that depending on you know what it is. I would also say that a lot of times when you have fixed budgets for things, CFOs in my experience like fixed budgets for things, I like I like a Thumbs per <laughs> I like a per employee budget for things because then it scales as as you know the people scale and if we think about just ERGs as a specific example um, historically um, I've worked in organizations where there's been a finite fixed um, usually very anemic budget for um, for ERGs um, but I, I like to think of this as okay well what if we have um, think of it in terms of like overall payroll like a percentage of payroll or you know a by person 
person, um, it, percentage of payroll is usually, by the way, I think a better way to think about these things because it allows for you know cost of labor differences and, and all of that, but it allows then budgets to scale as your organization scales or conversely to also shrink if, if the organization shrinks. Um, but that's been really helpful in terms of just trying to quantify for my CFOs, okay, this is you know what we're looking, if we look at the headcount projections and growth projections or shrinkage or whatever it is, here's how much these things are going to cost. Now let me talk about the data around why these things are important, whether it's you know engagement and tying that to retention or um, you know th those types of like, I mean, it's, it's digging deep for data sometimes, especially if you're in a small organization where you might not have robust data, it's looking at what you do have. Mm -hmm. um, reinforcing for you, Gianna, what I think is really important that was a lesson I learned in, in my first head of role was really like know your budget too. What you're talking about is know your budget, like know the ins and outs, know what the trade-offs are, know where you might have the capability to move things around because every time I've gone to a CFO, Wes included, the first question is like, well, what do you think you can do, right? And um, I've actually, and I've seen the flip side. I've seen people leaders just go to a finance team and say, I want this, I need this, this, this. And that, I've, I've literally been standing in a room when, when that kind of conversation has happened, I'm like, ooh, ouch, this is not gonna go well, right? So it's really about coming to the table and saying, I know this is what exists, here's how I'm thinking about it, let's work together on it, mm -hmm. Wes. So when I advise a company that's building software for ERGs to I've been an exec sponsor for uh, mm. several ERGs, so one, it's important to me. <laughs> um, my current company does not have any ERGs, so we're building that. Mm. Uh, so there are kind of two questions I usually ask, or a question then kind of a philosophy. Um, what do we want to be when we grow up? You know, like, what is Fabric in 10 years? What is Fabric in 20 years? What is X company in five years? And whatever those guiding principles are, like, they can kind of directly show where the budget is. I mean, a, a, a former finance team member's here, and, like, we all know, like, budgets are not these magic, mystical things. Yeah. Like, the day you set a budget, it's wrong. But <laughs> it's a guideline. So what one, the philosophy behind the budget is, okay, this should help us get to whatever our milestones are. Two, which is the comment, like, it's your money. You know, like, the only thing that I'm not fungible on is payroll. <laughs> like, you can't shift that money around, but everything else, like, you executive, you leader, you employee, like, it's your money. You push and pull where you want to achieve your goals and outcomes, go do that. As long as they're the right goals and outcomes. If you come wild card, like, left field with a new outcome, okay, let's have a conversation around that. But, like, if they're part of, you know, depending on how you do your goal systems or, um, uh, leveling process or whatever, like if these are within the corporate tenants, the strategic goals or initiatives for that year, cool, go do that. I'm not mad at that. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question and then we'll open it up and see if we have any questions from this audience. Um, and Gianna, I was, gonna, I was gonna give this to you. Um, <coughs> if you could share some soft skill strategies, um, and I like this one because it's very specific. Um, about how to grab the attention of your audience, C-suite audience, use finance language to become a good storyteller, and utilize data to back up those recommendations. Would love to hear about that. All right, I think that was like three questions. I know, it really wasn't fair. <laughs> I was trying, trying to, to memorize them. So um, from, from the top, I think um, when, when speaking with whomever, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in groups or, or like big groups, small groups, I think it's super important to be who you are and to just kind of be authentic, um, right? And so like, there, you see all these things about imagine the audience naked. I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that, by the way. Um, that's actually like where I'm not, yeah. Um, <laughs> But you know, like honestly, I think it's just be like let your personality shine. If you're introverted, extroverted, if you tend to be you know loud or quiet, or like just just be comfortable with who you are and let that be okay. Um, I think the second of three questions was around how do you talk um, in in finance terms? Finance language, being right? a Storyteller. Yeah. So I think it is important to know your audience. Um, and also know what you don't know. So that's like that self-awareness is super important. And so if you're gonna use industry terms or jargon, 
um, it's really helpful to define it as you're talking about it. And I'll give you an example. Um, internally at my company, when we were introducing more ERGs, we probably here in the room know that ERG stands for Employee Resource Groups. Well, a lot of people actually don't know that. If you're not in the, if you're not a people person, you probably don't know that. And so, just to kind of get everyone up to speed on the on the jargon and vernacular that that we think of, whenever I would say um, ERGs, I would immediately say Employee Resource Groups. So things like that just so you're including people because you don't want people to feel excluded or ostracized because they don't know what you're talking about. It, it, it's in your best interest to make sure you are not speaking above people. And if you're talking to a room full of finance folks, I personally believe you're not going to sound smarter or more, more impressive if you're trying to throw out all these financy terms. Just be clear. Sometimes simple is the best way forward. Don't don't try to say all of these, you know, Kager and CAC and like blah blah blah. Like you know, like just like say what, what you mean. Sorry. I agree. <laughs> um, right, because that's usually going to be a lot more effective. I found there was a third part. Utilize data to back up recommend. Utilize data to back up recommendations. And to be fair, you've given us a great example of that. But yeah, totally. And and I mean, some places that I go for data a lot of times. I, I love Gartner. I think that Gartner is super super helpful with you know finding information because it's it's objective. It's like a large you know pool of information. I mean, obviously Radford, there's Sherm, there you know Harvard Business Review, McKinsey. These are places that I go to a lot of times to find data in board materials or you know with my CF CFO or CEO, and that's usually really helpful. And in the absence of that, if you can't find it, go to other HR forums and circles and HR, you know, CHRO, CPO, or just HR leader groups, because a lot of times, if you're struggling to find that information, chances are other people have also struggled, so you can usually crowdsource some useful information. And if you use a finance term, we're going to sink our teeth into that. <laughs> it's so true. If the number's wrong, it's yes. all out the window. That's <laughs> so true. So true. Um, well, thank you so much. I, want, I do want to take a few questions if you have them. Yeah, right over yeah, here. Well, thank you to all three of you. I, I find you very calming, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be calming. So it's the ice cream. Um, like, so, oh, can this, does this work? That's okay. I'll I can repeat your question. For yes, the group. my question is: So all of us have different companies with different products in different industries, and there's like an amount of complexity to every business and the products we're trying to sell. So, like, to what extent do you think like the the head people leader of the company should really try to study and understand the business, and when does that become not useful? At what point does that become not useful? Um, the question is about um, to what extent should they, they had the people leader really understand the depths of, of the business and specifically around product, and et cetera. And all, and all the departments and all, and all the different elements of the business. Um, particularly, it sounds like we're talking about tech businesses, yeah. right? So I want to be clear on that. Gianna? And then yeah, next. so I, I think it's actually super important to be fluent in what your business does, mm -hmm. right? It allows you to be effective as a people leader. So, um, you know, I think knowing what your company sells, knowing how you're structured and organized, and knowing at least at a high level what various people and teams do will allow you and your team to be more effective. However, that said, I don't think you need to be a subject matter expert in every nuance and thing that goes on in the business. I would say that that's probably distracting if you try to become a subject matter expert in that. There are people whose whole careers are to be <laughs> subject matter experts in those areas. But I do think it's going to allow you to be effective if you're at least fluent and versatile and you know, know what's going on. Wes, thoughts on that? I think regardless of logo, generally you put any of us in a similar position in another company and 85% of the job is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, what's the other 15% and why did you join that company? Mm -hmm. So like, if you know the company, if you know the business, if you know like the products or whatever, that usually tells you why you're there. And I mean, the, the not so deep, dark, dirty secret is the higher you up you go, the more you have to sell. And mm -hmm. your customer changes regardless, but like, you need to sell the company on a regular basis. So you should know what's going on. I agree, like, if you're a deep kind of therapeutics company, you probably don't need to know every little nook and cranny of, about that product, but you should know the punchline of the business. You should know, you know why people join and what makes you truly unique. And one, that should keep you there, but it should also kind of 
maintain motivation throughout. But yeah, and also it's like it's the fun part. Like, it's the fun why part, did you join a business? Right. So I think it, it makes your job a lot easier because you're going to be, as you said, selling. I'm going to be selling to candidates. I'm going to be reinforcing to our mission to the employees that are sitting there. So really understanding that deeply, I think, is is core. I also look at it as. Um, as a product leader, our product being that we're building an amazing organization, and um, and I have to sit as as that type of product leader alongside the other folks that are building the pieces of our business, and those pieces include the financial strength, um, the financial product that you're going to be ultimately selling to a public market, and and the product that you're selling to our end users, which are the customers, which are paying us the revenue that's helping us build these other pieces. So. Um, in the same way that, that every product manager is not a subject matter expert, and you can hire product managers into different teams, and they can come in and get up to speed on the, on the um, important tenets of, of a product and be able to guide um, and really specifically be curious and ask really good questions. Um, I aspire to be that for the businesses and the organizations that, that I'm asked to help build, too. Yeah. Okay. Timing. Annette or Chase? Okay, we're good. All right, we're good with some questions. Hey, I think I'm hard. Yeah, um, I really appreciated Gianna what you said about learning, and I lead I lead learning and development, so I just had a follow up kind of question to that. In this, like, it is such a crazy time in tech, and we're so pressed in terms of resources, not just financial, but also people spending their time and where they spend their time, whether it's to get the product better to get more revenue or whether it's to enhance their leadership and help people. So I'm just wondering if any of you have any tips on continuing to invest in this time. And I mean, at least from all of your comments, how I see how important to you your people are and leaders are. Any comments on continuing to invest in that area and how to sell that to, to, to the C-level? Question about investing in, in learning and development of employees during a time when when um, the macro environment is not great and people are, are looking at budgets and tightening budgets. I think I'll go back to Gianna and then we'd love to hear from Wes. Yeah. So um, what what struck me as I was listening to you ask the question is um, I kind of see it as as three options. One of them is to decrease investment, keep investment in learning the same, or to increase investment. So it kind of depends on your starting place there, um, but let's just assume for a moment that there was some investment prior to this, this era that we're in right now in, in tech, um, where there was some investment in learning. Um, I've found, at least in, in my experience where I am now at Exabeam, um, we've decided to, to keep learning um, stable. So we're not decreasing the investment in learning. Um, we are also, very transparently, we're not increasing it either, but we're, we're keeping it um, you know, flat. And that's something that, um, you know, frankly, in this environment was something that was a conversation because many other organizations are reducing their investment in learning. So just being constant was a, a conversation because it was on the table, on the table with many other initiatives and priorities and programs and stuff too. And many other programs we did reduce and, and cut, but learning was something that we ultimately decided is a priority and it is important. Now was not the time to double down and to really increase it and to you know, spend more there, our board would not be happy with that decision, but keeping it as it is was, was where we landed. Wes, any thoughts on this? And if you don't have thoughts, that's fine too. I have too many thoughts. <laughs> uh, stay with me. Um, some people will eat the same thing every night, <laughs> and some people want a different dinner every night of their lives. <laughs> and I think it's kind of that, and I, I stay with me. Um, a lot of times, a lot, it, it's a reflection of the philosophy of the company. Mm -hmm. Some companies want to retain people for 5, 10, 20 years. Some companies really want a fresh crop every one or two years. And like, neither is right or wrong, and we've seen companies on both sides be very successful. The brass tacks we know is that retaining employees is significantly cheaper than hiring and training employees. Mm -hmm. So. I can't say which is right or wrong, but if you're lucky enough to be at a company that wants to develop people, if you're lucky enough to be at a company that truly wants to retain people, and you hire people that can scale, that's phenomenal. Like that, that has ROI all day. If you're not at that company, you can still be a really successful business, but it's just a very different motion. And neither is right or wrong. So like if you want to eat 
peanut butter and jelly every night of your life, or if you want slightly different sandwiches every night of your life. Neither is right or wrong. It just it's a different operating mode. It's a different culture. It's just a different way of being a business. So then there's space for the people leader to have the conversation and, and know which kind of culture they're in and what they're trying to build and getting pure alignment around those pieces. There's always room for macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I like macaroni and cheese. Um, I, I agree with you. I think plus one on both fronts. I think um, the conversation that, that I think about when I think about the value of learning and development function is um, really going to learning and development leaders and saying, here is the moment in time we're in, here is the strategic challenge, and um, I've seen success here when I've seen learning. There's a million different programs, as you know, that you can run from a learning and development standpoint. I think sometimes, or at least we've, I can say in the last 10 years, we've had the luxury of having it be all about individual growth and these, these really beautiful aspirational visions of um, what the company can deliver for the employee and have broadened the definition of what growth means for a million different kinds of reasons. Having been through two downturns before this, I've also seen some of our learning and development leaders be the organizational development folks that have come in on the white horse and really saved an organization because they've been able to come in with really strong ROI programs that look different than in, you know, when, when there's sunshine out. But those ROI programs are about reskilling folks into certain roles that are mission critical, helping with um, with, with um, internal mobility, really helping us get clear about the competency in the, as a, in the skills that actually exist so we know where we can start. And it is a different motion from a learning and development perspective, but it's no less valuable. And I've seen the role as a people leader is being able to articulate the shift. Because what I think people see is like, here's the path we've gone, which is all about like falling over ourselves. In a, in a very hyper strategic way to help people feel good about the, the, the position they're in. And I think that's when we feel, that's what people are like, we're not in that mode right now. We're not gonna just spend 20 hours a week on people on their special projects. So I think the onus is on us to be able to tell the story about how we're ready to shift as a learning and development function to meet the moment that we're in too. And once I've had those conversations about, no, 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 like CEO, CFO, this is what learning, it, this is what this function can do um, for us in this moment, I've had a lot less pushback. Question in the front, and then I see you in the back, Leona. How transparent are you with your employees when maybe a decision is passed down that's more maybe financially focused? Something like maybe learning and development being cut back. Like how, do you, how are you communicating that, and how transparent are you about the finances? How transparent are you um, on, on the financial piece and, and communicating around programs where there are cutbacks, cutbacks et cetera? Gianna? I feel like I always go first, and I got like the, the hard ones, but that's good. I, it's all, we're all friends, it's all yes, good. Yes, Yana, it's all good. Um, so I like to adopt the approach of, of being honest and authentic, um, obviously being appropriate at the same mm -hmm. time, right? And so let's say that there's some program or initiative or whatever that's been, that's been cut or reduced. I think being really clear with folks around, by the way, we've had some really hard decisions that we've had to make. And unfortunately, at least for the rest of this fiscal year, this is, you know, this is one of the changes and it's going down to this. This is, you know, like, and just being super open about it. Because ultimately, if you're not open about this stuff, they're gonna find out <laughs> anyway, right? Like ultimately, when you talk about budget cuts and things, like right. programs and initiatives, so you might as well be proactive and, and get out there in front of it so that there's not this gossip rumor mill going around. Plus it builds trust with employees when you're just really up front and there's like a no BS policy. It's like, you know, like, you know, you ask me a question and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna answer honestly. And unfortunately we've had some tough decisions to make and we've had to decide not to invest in one, two, three, and four. Right? So I, I'm a fan of just being out with it. Less taking away is hard. Always. Um, I mean, in a previous company, we used to joke, like, the day we take away the avocados, like, that's, <laughs> that's the death knell for the company. And, like, exactly. Avocados. <laughs> when you remove a benefit, when you remove certain things, like, people smell it. Like, hey, something's going on with this company. And so you better have really good communication. You better be very transparent. You better let people know what, why, and how. You know? Um, arguably, if you go to step zero of that, did we think this through at the beginning to make sure this was the right thing for the company in line with everything else? So 
in the best case scenario, which never happens. <laughs> like, you'll never have to take away and you can slowly layer on. But in the situation that you do, like ideally, folks can get to the answer themselves and you're giving them the breadcrumbs or kind of leading them there to be like, and this was why. Oh yeah, of course, like we shouldn't do that today. But if we do X, Y, and Z, it can come back. Great, let's figure that out. Or like we can open up these other paths. But yeah, I agree. Like the, the worst thing to do is lie to someone <laughs> because they smell it on you immediately. Like they can tell virtually in person, like they know you're lying. And like over time we learn to dampen that intuition, but like, you know when someone's lying to you, so might as well just tell them up front, like, this is what and this is why. The other thing I was going to add to that is I think especially in this environment, when, when and if you do have to make reductions in the budget for, you know, what celebrations or, you know, whatever it is, I think framing that from a place of we are one company with a shared goal and we're trying to make sure we remain a healthy business so that we don't have to do massive layoffs or you know like helping people understand the overall context and reason behind it's not just that we're trying to be hard-nosed about these things and and cut programs um, and the example that comes to mind is I have a very finite budget um, per, uh, like my, my team for 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 snacks um, and so if you live in California you know the the well, eggs, eggs. Oh. Um. And so for, for a short period of time, we didn't have eggs in the refrigerator and employees were like all up in arms. Um, like, and, and that's where an honest conversation around, and we, we now have eggs again because the price is starting to come back down. But oh my gosh. <laughs> So just being honest with Our people. Our avocados though. are your eggs. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. We, we once went from brand name soda to discount sodas. People freaked out. Right. <laughs> we must be on our times because we're on discount yeah. soda. <laughs> Leo and I saw that you had a question. Yeah, so I was actually <laughs> deliberately <laughs> come to ask this question. <gasps> Leona worked with Wes and I. Um, so especially we're in an environment of arguably harder times, like layoffs, been going, you know, have been going on. And as a finance person, um, a little bit of TMI, um, my, me personally been laid off before, so I know the feelings. Um, and I have to process hundreds of layoffs um, because I was in, you know, um, I'm in finance. So mm -hmm. when that happens, you, you know, do the calculation and da da and all of that. Um, and once you have been, uh, you know, go through this type of thing a few rounds, especially if you're, you're, you're if you know someone in finance, you sort of kind of can project and see that coming in pretty advance, in pre, pre, um, before everybody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. You act like you probably going to see it w when you are still in the heyday, if you will. Yeah. So, if you are not in the C suite, I'm not. Yeah. How do you raise your hand to have that co type of conversation with? The HR partners, um, while they're still gun hold. Oh, I need to hire X Y Z people because I need to support X Y Z. But then, you clearly see that coming. How do you have that conversation? And secondly, how can finance and HR partner way better, like three years in advance? Let's sit down and think through. You probably alluded to that earlier in your answer of, of reskilling internal mobility how can we do a better job like i tried to do that a little bit like from my previous experience but it was too late unfortunately so so to re repeat the question and, and let me know if i'm summarizing this correctly one is if you're sitting in a finance seat you're seeing things before anybody else in the org and a lot of times before your hr partners which you tend to work with pretty closely and and that's hard because you're sitting here seeing this and then you're seeing somebody who's in a different place saying, we should hire, we should hire. And then the second part of the question was, how do you get ahead of that? How do you make sure you plan ahead? Because layoffs are really brutal and it's really hard and I would agree with you on that front. Um, and you're hearing some things about reskilling and, and some of these things that we can be thoughtful about ahead of time. Is that a solution? Are there other options? But I think, I'll turn to Wes first on this one, and then Dion. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! I think if you've ever worked in commerce or retail, you can see them coming from a mile away. And it's Alan's earlier question, like, 
if the company is doing everything they can to teach people about the business, then everyone should be able to see it. And everyone should actually push back and be like, hey, maybe we're hiring too many people, or maybe sales is lagging, or maybe we need to harden the product, or like X, Y, and Z. You know, If people are appropriately trained and appropriately developed, they should know the answers. Um, and then we have to make the right decisions, and we should have a, a culture or a communication le level that like we're having these hard conversations together. I think even before that, we need a layer of people that always look out. I think often, especially now because of technology, because of whatever personal devices, our attention spans are one to three seconds, something like that. And rarely do we have people that are thinking this week, this quarter, this year, next year, the year after, the year after. So I think part of it, it's the onus of the company to make sure that, hey, we're looking forward. We're actually building to something that we want to over time. And like we know what we want to be when we grow up. And we're very clear on what milestones it takes to get there. And we're keeping ourselves accountable as to what those milestones are so that, like, hey, we're flexing forward or behind. Is this a good sign or is this a bad sign? And what do we do about it? So generally, like, do we have a plan? Do we have a roadmap? Do we know what we want to be when we grow up? And are we holding ourselves accountable every step of the way? There's an old Amazon concept of dates and gates. Like, you should know on any week, day, week, month, year, are you red, yellow, green? Green, great. The thing that people don't do is ask, so why is it green? Um, yellow, what do we need to do to improve? Red, oh crap, how do we fix this? But if we're not having those conversations being internally critical, then you're kind of dead in the water. Um, I think generally, like, it, it goes back to the earliest point. Like, finance and people see the entire company. So like, if folks are looking, they can tell. And arguably, if we're not looking, shame on us. Mm -hmm. you know? And so like, if, if we have an honest and collaborative culture, like, people should be having those conversations pretty regularly. And like, we've been in organizations where like, we just hired 600 people. We just hired 300 people. Was that the right thing to do? We don't know. But like, sometimes you just have to ask, hey, was that the right thing to do? And do we have milestones to actually measure if that was the right thing to do or not? John, I, I'm assuming you've probably been on the other side of that conversation, where you have a finance leader come and say, like, these are the things I'm seeing. How do you then think about that, and how do you translate that to your team? At what point do you translate that to your team? I think, I mean, honestly, hearing Leona say like that's a tough spot for her to be in where she knows something and she has partners that don't. Mm -hmm. How do you think about the timing in terms of bringing in a people partner, bringing in your HRBPs who are then partnering with the folks on the finance side? Yeah. Thankfully, I've always worked in organizations where we've had cultures where if someone saw something that you know anyone could raise their hand and say, "By the way, iceberg. Does anyone else see that?" And like, it's, you know, it's coming, right? Um, so thankfully, um, but uh, to, to answer your, your question, Kara, around well, what do you do in a situation where? you know, finance and, and, and HR or the people team might know something, when is it appropriate to share in a, in a broader way? My personal belief on this is to, when you have definitive and clear information and you have a plan of action, or at least you kind of directionally know where you're wanting to go, to share that. The example is um, late last year when the world started to, to halt, and I feel like in the world of like layoffs, it seems like everything was wonderful one day, and I swear, I feel like the next week, like everything just came to a you know screeching halt, and, and it was like, wait, wait, hold on a second. I thought we were, you know, like I thought everything was rosy and wonderful, um, and we started to see, you know, on the on the finance side um, that okay, we need to be really mindful and thoughtful because customers are starting to tighten their belts, which was you know, starting to impact us. And so when my CFO and I had that initial conversation, we said, okay, well, what are the actions that we can do? Well, let's slow down hiring. Let's you know, implement all of these different measures. And so I can't go to my team and say, oh, we're just slowing down hiring just because we felt like that's what we wanted to do, right? So that's where I sat down um, you know, with the, the talent team and said, look, we're in a place 
place right now where we need to be really mindful of our cash burn and our spend for these different reasons. And because of that, we're being super proactive and we are not going forth with all of these, you know, positions that we were looking to recruit for. We actually have a prioritization, like a critical, you know, list. This is what we're focused on right now. But just being super open with them around why and giving them that context was super, super, super helpful. At the same time, I think it's important to not be crazy alarmist, right? Like about everything. The recent example, and some of us were talking about this before, um, be before uh, we got up here on stage, was around SVB. I think that's another example of where if you're on the finance team, you were probably aware of what was going on a little bit earlier than folks on the people team. Didn't sleep for 96 hours. Exactly. <laughs> and um, at, at Exabeam, we adopted a policy of on, on Friday when all of this was going on. It's hard to believe that was just last week yeah. on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> like, how long? Oh, right. That was less than a week yes. ago. Um, we issued an employee communication um, that didn't go down the catastrophic path, but it's like, look, this has happened. This is where we are. This is what we're doing about it. We're going to come back to you with more information no later than Monday. Um, right, but like we were able to, to share information that was definitive, but not be alarmist about it, but just be super proactive, you know, with the comms. And I think, thankfully, I think we've trained our employees that we're going to be authentic and open and proactively communicate. So. The other thing that I think is helpful to also know is you you see this from your from where you're sitting. Don't always assume that your CFO has an awareness about what's happening in your in your part of the business. And I say the same thing for to my to my people partners and the rest of my people team. Like I'm actually counting on you all to say, "Hey, I know that we've talked I know that we have, so for example, let me play out this example. Leona is talking to your CFO and, and or you all are starting to have initial conversations around like, hey, some of these numbers are softening up, getting a little concerned about headcount, don't know what's coming around the corner. You're the one in the org engaging with an HRBP that may be totally 180 from where you are. And it would be really great information, I think, for that CFO to know, hey, I'm start. I'm I'm out in the field. I'm talking to my HR, my business march, my HR business partner, and they're the communication that they're sharing with the organization. The 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 conversation within the organization is really different than the conversation we're having here, because those are the kind of disconnects that can be a real challenge. So being able to feed that back up. And also being able to have that conversation with an HRBP, of, I hear what you're saying. I'm wondering if this conversation about really expanding headcount is where we're going to be in the next two months. Just signaling, and it might not be the like, hey, I can see six months from now. We're going to be in a different headcount scenario. But instead, I think it's totally reasonable to signal up and to signal your partner via your partnership and it helps us all get better in understanding what's happening within the org. Um, because I definitely rely on folks that are in, in out talking to everybody and, and are able to come back and be like, Kara, I know what you're saying is we might not be hiring that those 300 people this fall, but I just got out of two meetings where everybody was like, well, we're starting at 300 and we're going from, you know, we might be 500. So those kind of disconnects are really important for people um, I think to tell understand. Semi-related. Um, <laughs> I always ask people to do two things. One, always ask the question. Like I, I literally just came from a product offsite. I asked so many dumb questions, <laughs> and I wasn't the only one that wanted that dumb answer for the dumb question. Yeah. So like one, like if you see something, hey, what does this mean? Why are we doing it? What are we going to do about it? Like, there's no harm asking that question. And I guarantee you someone else is thinking that exact same question. So one, mm -hmm. ask the question. Two, to John's point about being alarmist, like, if you want to be critical about something, also come with a solution or three. Like, mm -hmm. I want to know that you've thought about it. I want to know that, you know, there are some ideas here and like right, wrong, or whatever. At least you're thinking about solutions, not just saying like, hey, that's burning down. <laughs> not, hey, that's burning down. Oh, I brought a bucket of water too. Mm -hmm. Great. Solution. So always actually come with something that we can, all right, let's idea it on this and figure it out. Or I hear the answers, I hear the solutions, but like that's not a 
issue for these reasons. Great, let's have that conversation instead. So one, ask the question, two, always come with solutions, and you'll be great. Okay, I think we are at time. So just wanted to thank everybody here. Wanted to thank you so much, Gianna and Wes, and um, really appreciate learning from you all tonight. So thank you. <laughs>